This is a series about a shelf layout for you, the subscribers of this channel. This is the beginning of the assembly of a shunting puzzle that you will be able to operate from the comfort of your home or anywhere with an internet connection. This is going to be an end scale layout on a 48 inch long by 10 inch deep shelf. I've gathered all of the parts that I need and now it's time to put everything together. Instead of building directly onto the 48 inch long by 10 inch deep shelf, I'm adding half inch thick cork that comes with self-adhesive backing. This is the same cork that is on my Z, N, and HO shelf display. Since the cork is wider than the shelf, I'm trimming it down using a utility knife. This left me with a rough edge to the cork. While I had already decided to put the edge towards the wall, I decided to seal it. My original thought was to use PVA glue, but then I had this brilliant idea that I was planning to paint the edge anyway, so why not seal it with acrylic paint? So I got out my cheap black acrylic paint and started painting the edges. Painting went really slowly as the cork absorbed the paint and it took a while to get it into all the nooks and crannies. But since this was not difficult enough, I decided to also paint the top of the shelf brown. When I got back into the hobby, due to lack of space, I started out working on a shelf layout. But I was new to operations and I made it way, way too complicated. I did not understand that model railroading operations was not about how many turnouts you can fit onto a layout. I also decided that I wanted to run trains, not just operate. I tried building a loop of track on a 24 inch by 24 inch piece of wood, but I wanted to run longer trains and did not appreciate the scenery side of model railroading at this time. At this point, I discovered N track and T track. I eventually settled on T-Track modules, and I've been really enjoying modular railroading. But I did not put any switching on my modules, as these were designed to just run trains. While I am going to continue working on my T-Track modules, I also wanted to create something I can operate. While recently looking into shelf layouts, I found shunting puzzles. Ingle Nook Sidings was the first puzzle I found which led me down a rabbit hole of research. I like complicated things, so I was drawn to Switchman's Nightmare by Lynn Westcott. But with 10 turnouts, I decided this was out of my budget. So I went looking for something a little less complicated. I settled on a variation of John Allen's Time Saver that for a lack of better name will be called Humanity Junction. The original Time Saver was made with Ys, but I'm using all right and left hand turnouts, which seems to be a more common variation these days. For more information on the original, I will include a link in the description. My variation is going to include an additional spur, and I'm extending the length of all of my tracks to the edge of the shelf. I'm going to use movable bumpers to shorten the tracks to make the puzzle more difficult, but only as needed. I'm not sure if I'm going to add scenery to this layout as it is all about operations, but I think painting everything was a good idea. I printed out the layout onto 8.5 by 11 inch pieces of paper at actual size and taped it all together to use as a template for laying out the track. I started out determining where I wanted to include re-railers. I had three of them that I could use. I was only thinking about where they would be best placed to help set the cars on the track and minimize derailments. I decided to use pre-built and store-bought stuff for simplicity and speed. I already had all of the track as I'd purchased it for a previous project that I thought I wanted to build. While I did have some slightly used track, I mostly used new track right out of the box to hopefully enable really smooth operations. Some of my initial locations that I tested for the re-railer tracks would not work out for one reason or another, one of which was interfering with the throw bar on a switch. It was at this point that I realized that I had designed the layout with track that I did not have on hand. On the plan, I drew 15 degree, 11 inch radius curved track sections. These are half the length of the 11 inch radius track that I had. I did have nine and three quarter inch radius half tracks but I wanted to use the widest curves possible. That said, all of the turnouts are number fours, short turnouts with wide radius curves. All of the track that I'm using is Atlas Code 80 nickel silver track with black ties. After overthinking every scenario, I decided to use 19 inch radius track and make some slight design changes. I temporarily removed the re-railers to focus on the remainder of the layout. In order to determine the next layout variation, I started placing the turnouts as these will determine a lot of the spacing and angles. I needed some 2.44 inch straight pieces, 
and they come as pairs in the small track assortment. I only use the 2.44 inch tracks from these assortments. For some unknown reason, my overhead camera froze at this point and I did not realize it for a while. My brain was in track configuration mode. I only have a single angle of this next part of the build. Take note of the position of the two turnouts closest to the camera. I have a left hand turnout on the right side of the runaround and a right hand turnout for the lower spur. I like the asymmetrical design but this configuration is going to change very shortly. While earlier I mentioned I will use movable bumpers to change the length of the spurs, I did use Atlas track bumpers at the end of each track to ensure you would not run the locomotive off the end of the shelf. I have some experience with locomotives hitting the floor and I do not need any more. As I was adjusting my original planning, I was not connecting any of the tracks together with joiners. I still thought I could find a place for the rear railers, but I started to realize that anywhere I put them would prevent me from using the movable bumpers. Eventually, I decided to exclude them. I will not be gluing down any of the tracks so that I can make adjustments in the future. Now that I had my track planned out, I moved all of the track over to the shelf now that the paint was dry. I initially thought I would run the feeder wires in towards the center of the track so the holes to route the wires to the bottom of the shelf would be inside the track rails. I realized I was just making my life more difficult and switched the wires to extend out from the track. This is another moment where I went with store-bought instead of building it myself. I'm using Pico N-Skill joiners with feeder wires already soldered on. I know that for many people it's easy to solder on feeder wires, but this is an option if you do not want to solder. I started with the track that will be against the wall, the mainline track, as this will be centered on the board and set one inch from the back of the shelf. If I get this in the correct place, everything else should fit on the shelf. I'm using a lot more feeders than needed. I'm hoping that this will help with smooth DCC operation as well as make it easy to make layout adjustments later if needed. I'm not planning on soldering any of the rails together, so additional feeders will also make up for any connectivity issues across joiners. I changed up some of the feeder wires from how I originally planned. On one side of the runaround, the wires are on the outside rails while on the other side they are on the inside rails. There was not enough physical space to put them all in the same place, and this ended up being a good solution. While I guess it makes sense to always put your feeder wires across from each other on opposite rails, there's not really any need to do this. With all the feeder wires in place, I moved on to adding in the rest of the joiners. Installing N-scale joiners is definitely tedious and I used my sense of feel to make sure everything was correctly connected and did not rely on just my eyesight. Sometimes it looked like I had both joiners connected, but I missed a few times. By twisting the connection very slightly, you could see if a joiner was not slid on properly onto both rails. It was during this process that I realized reversing the turnouts on the right side of the runaround was going to leave too large of a gap between the rails while using set track. So while I like the layout better with them reversed, I need to swap the position of the two turnouts on the right side. The turnout on the right side of the runaround is now a right hand turnout, which makes the next turnout a left. The result is that the two tracks on the right, while still parallel to each other, are now closer together. And the spur on the lower part of the shelf also needed to be adjusted due to the angle it was now on. I did not find it as visually interesting as the runaround is now symmetrical, but this is a layout for operations, not looks. The next step was to drill the holes for all of the feeder wires. I wanted to do this before I pinned in all the tracks so that I can move it out of the way while drilling. I lifted up the shelf onto one, two, three blocks so that when I drilled through it, I was not also drilling into my desk. I really don't want to mess up my desk. I chose the smallest drill bit that would still fit all the wires. I marked all of the locations with a white marker so I could move the track out of the way and still know where to drill. I 
I decided to mark the location of the throw bars on the turnouts so that I could also drill those holes. I used the smaller drill bit for all the pilot holes. I had to reference the instructions to determine what size hole I needed to drill for the switch motors that I was using. Then I went back with a quarter inch drill bit to make the holes for the slow motion switch machines bigger. I should have tested the locations after drilling the pilot holes, but I didn't. Pre-drilling these holes worked well for four out of the six turnouts. I am going to need to re-drill two of the holes before mounting the switch motors. Once everything was drilled out, I got out the shop vacuum and cleaned up the wood dust. Next, I ran all of the feed wires through the shelf and the layout started to look more like a layout. This video was made possible through the support of the channel members on both YouTube and Patreon, as well as the channel sponsors. Please support the companies that support this channel, as well as consider becoming a member if you would like to support my journey of model railroading in a small space. I used a small screwdriver to help align the joiners with the feeder wires. I once again confirmed the position of the mainline track, and using track nails started to pin the track in place. Does anyone have a good way to insert track nails into cork? Even with the soft cork, it still started to hurt my fingers after a while. I cannot imagine doing this on a huge garage layout. I am getting really excited about this build as I am starting to see its potential. There is a lot more to come on this build series and next time we are going to start the process of wiring up the track feeders and installing the switch motors for remote operations. Keep an eye on this series as I build my variation of the time saver so that you can find out how you will be able to operate the puzzle layout. From the city that never sleeps, farewell model citizens. It's all about humanity.